Okay, good evening. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I am the one who gets to introduce tonight's uh, evenings at Whitney Lecture. Welcome everybody to February's lecture. My name is Elaine Seaver. I am a professor of biology and my laboratory is situated here at the Whitney Lab. Um, so tonight, I'm uh, very pleased to be able to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Tanya Rosario. She's coming to us from the University of Georgia in the Department of Genetics and Center for, I'll probably get it a little wrong, but Tropical Medicine and Emerging Diseases, something like that. Um, so tonight, we have the story of uh, parasitic tapeworms. And um, I'm a biologist, so I love cool biology story and stories. And parasites often have interesting, unusual, and extreme bio biological characteristics. And I think tonight's story will definitely fit that paradigm. So I think we'll hear some cool, weird, gross, I don't know, uh, <laughs> details um, in tonight's talk. Um, okay. Before, I'm gonna tell you a little more about uh, Dr. Rosario's background. I just realized I also wanna encourage you to consider coming back next month uh, for our March Evenings at Whitney lecture, which is going to be on fish ecology in I think a uh, warming world. So hopefully you'll be back to check that out. Okay, so Dr. Rosario, just to tell you a little bit about her academic uh, background, she received her undergraduate a uh, degree at Wesleyan uh, University in Connecticut. And then she went on to do her PhD doctorate at the University of Virginia um, in developmental biology and cell biology. And then she started playing around with, and she was working with frogs, development of frogs. Um, but then she took the leap into worms. And uh, she went to work with Dr. Phil Mark at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And he moved his lab, uh, which is now at the University of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And she moved with him. And she uh, recently started her own independent group in 2021 at the University of Georgia. So I'm um, very excited to introduce her. And I'll just leave you with one. I. I um, I had the privilege of hearing her speak at a conference, and um, it, she did great. And so I thought, wow, we need to get her down and, and, and give a seminar. But this is really the first time I've had the opportunity to meet her. Um, and when I asked her this afternoon what got her excited about biology, she credits her grandfather for stimulating curiosity, interest, and love of nature. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Rosario. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine, for that introduction and for the invitation to speak at this wonderful venue. And I'm always so warmed by the fact that so many of you have come out to hear about my disgusting parasites. And I hope that by the end of today, you will find them as fascinating as I do. So a little bit about me. I am originally from Malaysia, actually, you know, a place, tropical nation developing country, certainly where a lot of parasites are more prevalent than they are in the developing world where I did all of my higher education here. So it might occur to you that this is what happened. I'm one of those people who saw the scourge of these diseases and decided that's what I'm going to invest my time in. But as Elaine alluded to, that is not even remotely what happened. Um, I, uh, looked to see what kinds of public health concerns, you know, the CDC would have if they were to tell you not to go to Malaysia, and there are a lot. And so I don't want to uh, downplay the importance of parasitic diseases. But parasites, they do have amazing biology. And I am a basic biologist. That is what has motivated me throughout my whole scientific career. So I started trying to understand gene silencing in yeast, and then I went on to understand the earliest uh, processes involved in the development of an embryo in frogs. And then I went to a planarian regeneration lab with the thought that that would be my future, to only to make a detour to study their evil cousins, the tapeworm. But at the heart of it, 
I just want to know how biology works, right? And I am a geneticist and a molecular biologist. And if you want to do that, I'm by no means alone, right? Lots of scientists want to do this. And one of the things that has really propelled us in molecular biology is the use of model organisms. And here I've just listed a few, right? The mouse, the fruit fly, the C. elegans nematode. There are, of course, many other traditional model organisms that have been amazingly powerful. We have made all kinds of discoveries that we wouldn't have been able to if we did not invest all of that human time and resources into developing the kinds of tools that we now have. It's allowed us to discover all kinds of genetic basis of diseases, even in the fruit fly, like Alzheimer's, and uh, to study the amazing new cell biology that we didn't know existed, right? It was from people just trying to understand the lineages of C. elegans that we came across program cell death, the process in which cells themselves just commit suicide. And that has such great implications for our understanding of cancer and even treatment of cancer that we wouldn't have known if we didn't just want to understand the basic biology of model organisms. Now, the model organisms have been powerful, but of course, they represent a tiny, tiny sliver of the biodiversity of life. And I love institutions like the Whitney here that really thought about how we can use and exploit and celebrate all of the evolutionary diversity that we see around us to understand how life works. And so with sequencing technologies becoming more readily available, we have been able to think outside of these model organisms and start to study the monsters in our midst. And that is really what has motivated my career. Um, and the more you look, the more you find, right? There are these crazy little microscopic creatures like the water bears that are the ultimate survivalists. They can survive desiccation and even the vacuum of space. And then around us, there are even more familiar organisms like say the Burmese python, which are probably friends to no one here in Florida. But think about it, right? What does a snake do? It takes, it eats a whole animal. If you were to extract the blood of a snake at that time and just look at the levels of triglycerides, cholesterol, of all of those fatty acids, the levels that you would find would murder a human being. But the snake has adaptations that allows it to eat and not just drop dead of a heart attack all the time, right? So there are all of this wonderful physiology around us if we bothered to look at the monsters in our midst. And that has what has really motivated the kind of scientist that I have wanted to be. And speaking of monsters, there are, of course, tapeworms. I think I will do this manually. If you have been exposed to tapeworm literature, it's probably from stuff like this, right? All of these headlines that have these eye-popping numbers of these incredible lengths that tapeworms can achieve. That is a six meter tapeworm, beef tapeworm taken out of a unfortunate human patient. Yes, they are certainly monsters. And I want to understand the molecular basis of their amazing physiology. So if we were to put tapeworms in their phylogenetic context, what they are, are flatworms, okay? So here is a phylogenetic tree of flatworms. And on the top here, you have a whole bunch of free living worms. And in this blue box, this is a clade that is exclusively made of parasites, including all tapeworms, also known as cestodes. And the thing that unites all of these parasitic flatworms um, is their skin, okay? So the name of this clade is the neodermata, which stands for new skin. And this skin is called a tegument. It is like nothing you have ever imagined. It is one cell, one cell that surrounds the entire body of the tapeworm that is fed in by thousands and thousands of little packets that contain the DNA that then connects through these small bridges to the one cell. And what that one cell has allowed these flatworms to do is to exchange information with its environment. So much so that this is how the tapeworm eats. It has no gut. It eats entirely through its skin and it survives in the intestine, which of course is the ultimate welfare state in which it can get all of the nutrients that it needs. So that is one insane feature of these worms, this wonderful tegument skin that it has. And of course, tapeworms also cause disease. 
And they are actually found in a lot of different body forms. They have larval stages as well as adult stages. The adult stages are what you think of when you think of a tapeworm. But the larval stages are actually far more diverse. This is not even the half of it to represent the kinds of different forms that these larvae have. And the larval stages can also exist in more than one host sometimes, the intermediate host, whereas the adults are going to be found in the intestine of the uh, definitive host in which the reproductive stages mature. And we as humans can actually be infected by both stages of these life cycles. So uh, we can be infected by larvae and by adults. So in the adult stage, the most common tapeworm that infects humans is actually called the dwarf tapeworm. And this tapeworm has its normal life cycle, but the genius of the tapeworm is that it has been able to adapt to both stages of its life cycle in a human being. So now human beings can actually pass this tapeworm from human to human, which is what allows them to be the most common tapeworm that we find. Now, the bronc tapeworms are much, much larger than the dwarf tapeworms, as their name um, um, suggests. And in general, if you're going to get a tapeworm, the bigger it is, the worse it is for you, because they're scavenging for stuff that's limiting in our diet anyway. Now, if you were to be infected with an adult tapeworm in your intestine, that would be disgusting, maybe painful, but it is not going to kill you. It is the larval stages that are far, far more pathogenic. And these larvae can grow like cysts that are not unlike tumors, which invade their favorite organs of interest and can spread in many cases, like even metastasize without new reinfection. Now, in the blue here, I've actually shown you the host species of many of these uh, larval tapeworms that infect humans. And as you can see, we are actually sometimes a part of the normal life cycle of this world. But the problem is when we accidentally play the intermediate host for the larval stages. So instead of getting in a cow, this worm gets into a human. Instead of getting in a gerbil, this worm gets into a human. That actually causes the problems. And if the tapeworm to avoid is definitely tenia solium, which is the pork tapeworm. Now, this tapeworm um, cycles through human beings and pigs. And if we were to get the larval stage, then the disease that it causes is called neurocystisocosis, which can have very severe symptoms indeed, from learning disorders and uh, epilepsy to uh, blindness and even death. And so I think it's worth walking through a little bit how this disease works. Okay, so. The normal life cycle, as I said, depends on humans and pigs. So let's say there's a pig that is infected with this tapeworm and the pig's got the tapeworm cyst in its muscle and we eat undercooked pork. So what would happen to the human that ate that undercooked pork is that they will have a tapeworm in their intestine. This human does not have neurocystic psychosis. Okay? You cannot get the disease from eating undercooked pork. Pork. What you get is tapeworms in your intestine, and maybe you have one, maybe you have many, they can get to quite large sizes, actually, okay? Now, part of the problem, actually, is that many of these humans do not know that they have a tapeworm, and uh, they might be asymptomatic, even. But what happens is they're shedding the tapeworm eggs in their feces. So either this person prepares food without washing their hands, or there's poor sanitation in the area and the sewage has gotten on the crops. And then the crops get contaminated with tapeworm eggs that get ingested by another human being. So I don't know if this is reassuring, but uh, you can be a vegetarian and get neurocystisocosis if you eat food that has been contaminated with tapeworm eggs. And what these eggs then do is then develop into the larval stages that want to be in a pig, but they are in a human being and they tend to lodge in neural tissue. So here is a um, brain slice from a patient that succumbed to the disease neurocystisocosis, in which you can see all of these horrible cysts that have lodged in the brain. Often these cannot be treated other than by surgical removal of those cysts, okay? So you can see how these worms have such complicated life cycles. They have many different body plans that they have to take. They have this transmission problem that they have to get from host to host, okay? Lots of different things that the tapeworm has had to um, overcome in order to be a successful parasite. Now, on top of all of that, 
It is a flatworm. And another feature of flatworms is their propensity for regeneration, which is where I started out to begin with, okay? So again, here, this is the phylogenetic tree. We've got our tapeworms here. And there's a lot of different members of the flatworm phylum. But if you look at their capacity to regenerate, it's actually quite varied. So there are some worms that never regenerate. For example, blood flukes that cause diseases like schistosomiasis never regenerate. Now, a lot of the worms actually show some kind of capacity to regenerate, but not always. Ability to regenerate sometimes, or, but not others, from some tissues, but not all tissues. So for example, these macrostomum species here can regenerate a new body from a head fragment, but the body fragment will never regenerate a new head. Okay, so lots of different regenerative abilities. And then there is the Ferrari of regeneration, which is the flat freshwater planarian Schmittea meditradia. Okay, so this worm is amazing. If you cut it into two, the head will make a tail, the tail will make a head. If you cut it into 10 pieces, you will get back 10 planarians. Okay, and the reason that this worm is so great at regenerating is that it maintains a population of stem cells in the adult stage of the worm that some small, some subpopulation of them have the ability to make all, all cell types, okay? We call them pluripotent neoglasts, that is the ability to make all cell types. So here is a cartoon representation of this worm in which in these blue dots here, that's representing its stem cell population. If you were to dose it with a lethal amount of irradiation, you will kill off all of its stem cells and that worm will surely die. But if you transplant in a single one of these pluripotent neoblasts like stem cells, that one cell, will divide, make more of it, and then differentiate into all the adult cell types that the worm needs and rescue it from certain death. But these stem cell, these, these pluripotent-like stem cells, they're not exclusively found in these regenerating planarians. We have evidence of them throughout the whole flatworm phylum, regardless of the regenerative ability, seemingly, right? So what is actually happening here? How are these stem cells being regulated, especially in all of these parasitic worms? And I do not think it takes a stretch of the imagination to imagine all of the different ways in which stem cells can really aid and abet these parasites, right? They can promote their regeneration, their repair. They can promote the ability for them to take on these diverse body plans. They can give them prolific reproductive outputs since they have to actually be transmitted from host to host. And they may even be central to the evolution of that crazy skin, the tegument, okay? So this is what I've wanted to understand. What is the molecular regulation of these stem cells in these parasitic flatworms like the tapeworms. But then I come full circle to the problem of wanting to dive down at the molecular level and working with a non-traditional model organism here, right? So the challenge that fell on my plate was to try and figure out whether there was a tapeworm species that we could use in the lab and make these kinds of gene level discoveries that we want to understand how these stem cells are actually regulated. And the species that I chose is this one, Hymenolepis diminuta, the rat tapeworm. So it is from the genus Hymenolepis. So it's in that same genus as that most common tapeworm that infects humans, the dwarf tapeworm. But luckily for me and my lab, uh, this worm would much rather be in a rat than in a human being that scientist that came before me didn't try. Here's an excerpt from a 1967 paper by C.P. Reed, in which he and a couple colleagues tried to infect themselves and failed and therefore concluded that the 20th century American male does not seem to be a highly satisfactory host for this worm. Now, what I do think is that is a highly satisfactory laboratory model. And we've been able to establish a whole bunch of tools that make it so. And I'm just going to highlight a couple that I think are most important. So we are able to um, investigate patterns of gene expression. Okay, So in these images that I show you on the top here, the purple staining is showing you the expression, gene expression pattern of a particular target gene. So this one here, this putative cat here, is expressed throughout the whole nervous system of this worm. And this gene here, WINT111, here is this beautiful stripe pattern that actually corresponds to the uh, strobula of this worm or the segments that these worms can form. Okay, so we can investigate gene expression patterns. And 
Crucially to me, we can also investigate their functions because we're able to knock these genes down and ask what happens because we can grow these worms outside of their rat host. So we can grow them in a concoction of sheep blood in a hypoxic chamber, and we can take those uh, tapeworms out and micro-inject into them a genetic construct that allows us to target a specific gene of interest as long as we know its sequence and cause the reduction of its expression. Then we can ask, what does this gene do? Does it have a function in promoting growth and regeneration in our world? So the other really important thing that we were able to do is to maintain the life cycle easily. As I've already alluded to, tapeworms have these complicated life cycles. If we wanted to study Tinea solium, we would literally need human beings and pigs. But we can maintain the life cycle of these worms really easily with beetles and rats. Okay? So the larval stages grow in the beetle until they make an infective sister cercoid. If you were to dissect open a beetle, this is what you would see. Okay? This is the larval cyst. The tapeworm is in this pocket here, okay? Now what happens you know, in the wild is that a rat might eat an infected beetle and then this tapeworm cyst gets into the stomach. It gets permeabilized by the stomach acids and enzymes and then receives an activation signal from bile that triggers the release of the juvenile tapeworm. And we can recapitulate this in a Petri dish. And if you do that, this is what you get. So here, is the juvenile tapeworm with its actively moving suckers here trying to escape from the, the cyst that it will shed like an old coat and it'll use those suckers to latch on to the intestinal lining where it is going to grow to reproductive maturity. And a newly existed juvenile tapeworm is extremely small, about 200 microns. That's if you take eight human hairs and put them together, that is the length of the worm. And it's gonna grow to an equilibrium length of about 60 centimeters. It can even get to a meter long. We can get 10 of these babies from a, from a rat. And the rat, by the way, is completely fine somehow. Okay, it doesn't seem to care that its intestine is full of tapeworms. And this is the typical body plan of the tapeworm. You've got this head up here, and those are not eyes, those are those suckers. And if directly behind it, it's got this neck tissue. And then most of the body is made up of these segments that have a very unfortunate name, proglotid. So I will use proglotid and segment interchangeably here. And each and every one of these segments are making the entire male and female reproductive structures. So every single one of these is going to make three testes and one ovary. And what the worm can do is bend over on itself, or two worms can come together, and then sperm gets exchanged from one segment to another, fertilization happens, and then that starts to grow into a developing embryo. So by the time you get to the end of the tapeworm, it's just chock full of these embryos that now need to complete their next stage, their larval stage, which it cannot do in a rat, needs to find itself in a beetle. So what does the tapeworm do? It just pinches off its body, lets that go out with the poop, that can get eaten by an unsuspecting beetle, and this is how the life cycle can actually continue. So as part of its normal life cycle, it has to shed its own body. But instead of getting shorter and dying in the rat, it continuously replaces these segments from that neck tissue, okay? So it seemed obvious to me that if these worms were using a similar planarian like pluripotent stem cell population, it could, right? It has this impetus in order to complete its own life cycle. So when I started working on these worms, I thought they would make a really great model to understand stem cells and regeneration here. And these are some of the major questions that my lab is trying to address, right? How does the tapeworm regenerate? How does stem cells, how do stem cells contribute to this regeneration? What are the signals that actually regulate those stem cells and growth and regeneration in these crazy tapeworms? So what did we already know about regeneration in Hymenolepis diminuta? Is it turns out it wasn't nothing. There were experiments that were done back in the 50s and the 60s by C.P. Reed and Chauncey Goodchild, who took a mature tapeworm, and then they amputated a piece that had the head, the neck, and a few immature segments. And then they transplanted that little piece into the intestine of a rat. And that little piece was able to regenerate into a fully mature tapeworm. Okay, great. 
So if it did it once, can it do it again? So CP Reed took that regenerated worm and cut it again, transplanted it into a new rat horse, and that little piece regenerated into a fully mature tapeworm. So he did it a third time and a fourth time. He did serial amputation and transplantation for 14 years before he finally gave up. The tapeworms never did, okay? But the problem with this transplantation experiment is that you can only ever test the competence of this tissue that is attached to the suckers, right? Because those suckers are necessary to just maintain the tissue in the intestine of the rat. Now, this is actually a simple problem if you can grow these worms outside of the rat host, like we can. So now you can take these worms and cut them into whatever pieces you want and ask the question, what tissue is actually competent to regenerate? Is a tapeworm like a planarian? Can I cut it into 100 pieces and disturbingly get back 100 tapeworms? Thankfully, I'm here to tell you that that answer is no. The regenerative potential of tapeworms is quite limited. If you were to cut off the head, the head will never regenerate a new worm. If you were to cut off any part of the body, that body will never regenerate new segments. Now that little body piece will continue to grow, will continue to mature. If you have more than one of them in a flask, they can knit with each other and contribute to the next generation, but they will never add new segments. The only tissue that's competent to regenerate is this neck. And even if you cut a small piece of that neck that has zero segments to begin with, it can regenerate hundreds of segments over the course of a couple of weeks in in vitro culture. Okay, so only the neck can regenerate. If only the neck can regenerate, then that is the money tissue, right? If we are going to identify the genes that are regulating a stem cell population, it should be there. So how do we get at those genes? So the strategy that we employed was to take advantage of irradiation as a tool, okay? Because stem cells, they need to divide in order to make their progeny and in order to maintain that stem cell population. And we are able to label the dividing population with a little trick using this chemical called FRIEDU. And I will show that uh, multiple times throughout my talk. You can see all of these little green dots here represent a dividing cell, so part of the stem cell population. And just like uh, we do to treat tumors, we can use irradiation in order to halt the progression of cell division. Now, those cells can no longer divide. They either make their terminal fate or they die. Either way, you lose that whole population. So you can see in the irradiated group here, we no longer have this green population of dividing cells. So the strategy then is what is different between these two tissues, right? So we have a control group of necks and an irradiated group of necks, and we extract um, all of the RNA, all right? So we can measure gene expression of all tapeworm genes using RNA sequencing. And just to represent what you might get, I'm here showing you here just four genes and using font size to represent their expression level, okay? So in the control case, you might have gene A that's really highly expressed, gene B a little lower, gene C a little lower than that. And what we're looking for is in the irradiated group, what are the genes that are now lowly expressed and even not expressed with the hypothesis that the reason that we're not seeing them in this group is that these are the genes that are normally expressed in that stem cell population that is now gone after irradiation. So using this strategy, we were able to identify around 600 plus candidate stem cell genes, okay? So now we have to do a whole bunch of validation on whether or not we're right about these genes. And we use that method of looking at gene expression patterns in situ hybridization in order to suss this out. And what we found is a lot of different patterns. So we found some genes that are really broadly expressed throughout the neck, very lowly expressed in this head region, lots of expression in the neck. And other genes that were expressed in the neck very different patterns, right? This gene Prospero here is expressed in a small subpopulation of cells within the neck and not expressed in the head as well. And this makes sense if you think about the hierarchy of relationships of stem cells making whatever daughter cells, right? You might have at the top of the hierarchy that pluripotent stem cell that has the ability to make all cell types, and it might give rise to more lineage restricted stem cells that maybe are only ever gonna get muscle or only ever gonna make skin. And then your differentiated cells. 
So maybe a gene like LAM and B receptor here is expressed in all of these four populations represented by this cartoon, but Prospero is only expressed by one. And it might be the one that's on the top of the hierarchy, or it might be in one of these more lineage restricted populations. So we saw lots of these patterns. We could try and characterize them, um, and which we did. And that gave us a lot of interesting candidates to follow up on. Now, just because a gene is expressed in the stem cell population, which we did further validation that I'm not going to show here, doesn't mean that it has an important function, right? Ultimately, what we, what we want to follow up on are the genes that are really important for the growth and regeneration of these works. But as I told you before, we are able to do that by knocking down the expression of our target genes. So we can microinject in a construct to target our genes of interest from our screen and then look at whether or not they can grow and regenerate after we amputate the works. So here's a two millimeter scale bar. That is the uh, length of the amputee that we start with. If we use a control construct that is a gene that is not expressed by tapeworms at all, we can get these nice regenerates from that little fragment. And if we were to knock down in a sub, whatever genes of interest that came out of our screen, we can see that you can get a growth defect here. And since these are genes that are expressed within the, psych the stem cell population, we would expect to see a loss of that population, which is also what we see. So again, here in the green, we are marking the dividing stem cells here, and there are tons of them in the control, and a real paucity of them in our knockdown conditions. So we got what we set out to do, right? We were able to find all of these genes that are importantly regulating the st tapeworm stem cells. But I told you the tapeworm can only regenerate from this neck tissue. So is there a population that is resident only in this neck? that would tell us why the tapeworm can only regenerate from this tissue, because that would be the population of pluripotent stem cells that are at the top of the hierarchy. And so when we looked at our suite of genes here and tried to figure out which one was only expressed in the neck, the answer was zero, okay? Absolutely nothing, nada. It didn't matter if it was a gene that was broadly expressed in the whole stem cell population or genes that were expressed in a small limited subset, all of them were expressed throughout the entire tapeworm body. So all of these images here are just representing parts towards the head, from the head towards the tail here. So more, all of them are expressed in that neck, but they're also expressed all throughout the body of the tapeworm. Now, this is science, right? You have a hypothesis, you go out, you get your data, and it doesn't prove your hypothesis, it doesn't even support your hypothesis, right? So you go back to the drawing board and you ask yourself, well, maybe we're wrong about the reason that this worm can only regenerate from its neck. Is it possible that there are actually stem cells everywhere in this worm and there is some external reason for why it can only regenerate from its neck? So what we needed was a way to actually functionally figure out stem cell activity. And we did this by borrowing that experiment from the planarians that I told you about earlier in my introduction. So here's what we do, right? We take a host tapeworm and we dose it with a lethal amount of irradiation so that we kill off all of its own stem cells. This worm is going to die. But what if we now take some donor tissue, right? And from that tissue, we can um, make a cell preparation and then transplant those cells into the neck of the world. Okay. If in that donor tissue there are cells with stem cell ability, then maybe those cells will take, and when we amputate the worm, we'll actually rescue the ability of this irradiated host tapeworm to now regenerate. Right. So if we were to inject buffer or nothing at all, what we get is degeneration. Right. We cut five millimeters. This is a one millimeter scale bar. You can see that all of these little frag tiny fragments are going to die. If we were to inject worms from just whole normal tapeworm donor tissue, some of them that tapeworm are their stem cells, we can in fact rescue regeneration in this assay. Okay, we can get them to now regenerate. Great. So that sets us up to do the experiment that I actually want to do. There's a part of the worm that can regenerate because it has the neck. There are parts of the worm that never regenerate. For example, the most tail part of the worm, right? Never regenerates any new segments. So let's extract cells from both of these tissues and ask, are those cells inherently different if we were to transplant them into the neck? And what happens is both populations can actually rescue regeneration, okay? Um, so it doesn't matter where they came from, as long as we return them to the neck, they can now do the job. So what is special 
about the neck. There must be signals in the neck that are important for regulating regeneration and maybe for regulating the behavior of those stem cells directly even, okay? All right, so this is what we have. Lots of different genes expressed in this stem cell population. They're everywhere throughout the body of the worm, but only the neck can regenerate. Why can only the neck regenerate? I cannot tell you how uninspiring this neck tissue looks, okay? If you look at it, it's a piece of meat. There is nothing that distinguishes it from any other part of the worm. But of course, it is juxtaposed to the head, right? So what if the head is somehow important for regulating regeneration? We know the head doesn't regenerate itself, but is it really playing no role here? So to test this, we basically tried to they recapitulate that experiment that C.P. Reed had done with his serial transplantation, but to do it in vitro style, right? So this is the experiment. We take a tapeworm, okay, and we cut a small piece that's about two millimeters in length, uh, has the head, has the neck, and allow that to regenerate in vitro, and that little piece will grow quite nicely. And then we take that regenerated worm, and we amputate the headmost region again. And that little piece is going to regenerate. And we do it a third time, a fourth time. Regeneration is really quite robust, OK? But what would happen if we first decapitate the worm and we take the same length, right, that two millimeter piece? That piece is going to regenerate great because I told you the neck is all you need. The neck is necessary and sufficient to regenerate these segments. But now we go back in and amputate the most, the headmost part of this worm, and now regeneration is actually stunted. And here I'm showing you just the quantification on the y-axis here of the number of segments. You see this huge drop-off that happens when you no longer have the head. So the head is important for regeneration. And regeneration is actually finite without these signals that come from the head. So imagine that the head is sending some kind of signal into the neck. Are those signals even uniform now across the neck? Or is there much more complexity that we can discover in the seemingly uninspiring tissue? So what we did was we treated the neck like it was a loaf of bread and we cut it into slices. And then we could take each individual piece there and then look and measure the gene expression levels across this whole tissue so that we can figure out if there are genes that are expressed in different ways as a function of its distance from the head, right? And we found that at the gene expression level, this tissue is far, far more complex than we ever imagined. We found a whole bunch of genes that are enriched towards the head. For example, this one here is only expressed in a collar directly below that head and nowhere else in the worm. And other genes that are just more enriched towards the head, and then they start to go down as you move away. And then we also saw the opposite, genes that are not expressed towards the head, but only start to come up as we move towards the posterior part of the worm. So this is the kind of work that my lab is working on now, trying to figure out how these differentially expressed genes in this important tissue are regulating the stem cells and are regulating the ability of these worms to regenerate, for which I have no data to show you, but I do have worms growing in the lab, waiting for me to get back to Georgia to figure out what is actually happening here. Okay, so just to recap here, we've got a whole bunch of dividing stem cells and they're throughout the whole body of the worm. There's a lot of interesting things about the populations that we are trying to further investigate. But the worm can only regenerate from its neck and that regeneration is absolutely dependent on signals that come from the head. And exactly what those signals are, we still do not know. But of course, the head is... It does have a brain. This is a tapeworm brain here. Um, and are there these specific signals that are only resident there that enable the worm to regenerate? What we do know is that we do have a whole bunch of complexity of gene expression patterns within the neck. And some of those patterns are totally dependent on the presence of that head, so that if we amputate the head, we can change those gene expression patterns as well. And all of this comes together in order to enable this worm to regenerate. So. My very broad conclusion is tapeworm stem cells need friends, okay? They cannot exist on their own. And this is not even remotely new news, okay? Because all stem cells need friends. No stem cell exists in a vacuum. Every stem cell system that we have ever looked at has a niche that is important for regulating all kinds of signals, including the ability of those stem cells to just be maintained, to survive, and then to do what they need to do. 
And so we are out there trying to discover those signals. And already in other species of tapeworm, we see a lot of similar gene expression patterns that represent these um, you know, micro environmental signals that we are starting to tease apart in the tapeworm neck. And I think this is really important because if it is working like it works in a planarian, then it is possible that all you need is one pluripotent stem cell, and that one stem cell is going to be able to do the job. So targeting those stem cells directly as a therapeutic, for example, is probably quite difficult. But if you understand the signals that actually regulate them, then you have a much better chance of actually making a therapy that is much more useful. So all that comes together to tell you that also, I also need friends and none of these work would be possible without uh, my lab, my mentors and all of the collaborators that have supported our work. So this is a picture of my new and growing lab, um, but I owe a big debt of gratitude to my postdoc mentor, Phil Newmark. It's in his lab that I started this work and he now runs a joint lab with Melanie Sagonis and they, are, they continue to be collaborators with us working on the planarian side of things uh, with Jim Collins here working on schistosomes, which is another parasitic platform, and the three of us are, are investigating a lot of similar pathways in cell biology that are differently used by these uh, flatworms here. Um, I also like to give a big shout out to Dick Davis, who is the only reason that a frog embryologist was able to work in a parasitic system because he had previously as a graduate student worked on this tapeworms and he had moved on from them, but he hosted me in his lab and in his home and he taught me everything that I know about how to propagate the life cycle of these worms. And without him, uh, I would not be standing here today. We also have funding support from the NIH and thank you so much for your attention. I'd be very happy to take any questions that you have.